Hi, MOA family. This is Dr. China Ju, president of the Minority Opportunities Athletics Association, and welcome to day two of the MOA virtual symposium. I hope you enjoy day one, and we're very excited about our guest speakers and panelists today. We hope that you learn something, network, share, and continue to grow with us as an organization. I want to thank Dr. Renee Miles Payne and her team for putting this symposium together. They worked very hard and I'm sure you're going to enjoy it. Without further ado, day two, enjoy. Thank you, China. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to day two of our annual symposium. My name is Michael Sante, and I'm the Senior Director of Compliance and Membership Services for the Big East Conference, and really excited about today's session. Uh, the developments of the past week have highlighted the need and importance for conversations around diversity, inclusion, and equality, and hope this session can provide you some strategies and techniques uh, to successfully have these conversations in your role and in your community. It is with great pleasure that I introduce you to our first speaker today, Dr. Leonard Moore, Vice President of Diversity and Community Engagement at the University of Texas. Please click the link in the chat for the session description and bio information on Dr. Moore. Following Dr. Moore's remarks, we will open up the floor for a Q&A session and questions can be submitted via the Zoom chat function. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming our first guest of the day, Dr. Leonard Moore. Uh, thank you, Mike. I want to thank uh, uh, Dr. Miles Payne as, as well, doing big things at the University of Miami, Mike at the Big East office, uh, and also, you know, Dr. China Ju, a sister up at the University of Wyoming, uh, who leads this great organization, and also Stan Johnson, the executive director. And uh, we've seen the events over the past uh, four or five days, and we've seen student athletes using their voice, and coaches releasing statements, athletic departments releasing statements. And it, it is critical that we remember that pe some people have been doing this work since the 1960s. So the issues aren't nothing new. Uh, they've been going on, particularly as inter, inter, uh, you look at race and intercollegiate athletics or the black athlete in college athletics. It's been going on for some time. And, you know, for the first time now, we're starting to see student athletes use their voice in a way they hadn't used since the 1960s. So it is, uh, uh, it is glad to be here. I know many of you come from different parts of the college athletic world, but probably as of three or four days ago, all of you got a new title added to your a, a new job description added to your title uh you are now officially spokespersons for the race um i know many of you all are departments are having staff meetings and colleagues have been reaching out via phone text or email and the one question they're always asking is how are you feeling i want to challenge you in many ways to flip the question around and be proactive in reaching out to your colleagues your white colleagues and ask them, well, how are you feeling about how things are going on? Uh, many of us are gonna be at staff meetings where we're gonna be asked to stand up and speak on behalf of a whole bunch of people. But I just wanna encourage you that maybe, it may be a good time for us to hear from our white colleagues and other colleagues about in many ways, how they're feeling because many people know how we feel. But I think many of our colleagues are surprised that we deal with the same issues too. I was telling a group of coaches uh, from uh, the Sunbelt Conference that whenever I get on the highway and drive, I always have to think about how I'm dressed and I leave my wallet typically on the dashboard in case I am stopped by a police officer. So I um, hope you all are doing well. Some of this stuff is exhausting. Uh, you know, I've dedicated my life to this work, so I'm not shocked at it. Uh, it'd just be interesting to see what comes after all the statements and things, uh, things of that nature. So just in terms of this session, we're going to talk about, you know, how to get stuff done. Uh, we as black folk have always fought for people to have a seat at the table. But having a seat at the table is only one part of it. Uh, you got to have a seat at the table. Part two, you got to use your voice. Then part three, which I think is the most important, how do you move the ball down the field in some strategic ways where you can get uh, things done? Uh, at the University of Texas, I'm a, a vice president and also a history professor. I'm history professor by training. I've been a professor 22 years. Uh, I manage a team of 400 people. I want that to sink in, 400 people. I have 400 full-time employees and we have an operating budget of $40 million. It is the largest d &I, uh, organization of its kind in the world. Uh, and that takes into account the corporate space and also anywhere at any college or university. Uh, 
400 FTEs and 40 million. So at the University of Texas, we still have a lot of stuff to fix, but the commitment has been there in terms of a, of, of a real budget and in terms of power to be able to sit at the table and get things uh, done. There are a couple things in my portfolio that are interesting and I wanna point out because I think it will help us on uh, this conversation. Uh, I manage the University of Texas charter school system. Uh, we have one brick and mortar school downtown Austin and we have about 20 schools in residential facilities across the state. These include uh, schools in uh, male residential facilities that are primarily populated by black and Latino juveniles. And uh, we have a, a school for uh, individuals who suffered brain trauma. And we also have a school, we opened up two schools recently for young women who've been victim of, victim of uh, sex trafficking. So we have a lot going on there. We also have the Hall Foundation for Mental Health in my portfolio. We give out about $15 million a year, primarily in inner city and rural communities. And lastly, the Texas High School Athletic Association, which is probably the most political body of any of, of, of in the state of Texas. That reports to me as well. And in addition to that, about 37 programs and units uh, on the main campus. Um, I had a situation the other day. Have you all ever been at a meeting and somebody said something flat out crazy or offensive? And it was so offensive that you didn't even know how to respond to it. I'll give, and I'm sure y'all have many, many of these situations. I was at a faculty senate meeting uh, about three years ago. And the basketball coach at Texas, Shaka Smart, was making a presentation. Now, I've been a professor 22 years, all right? When the meeting is over, one of my colleagues points to me and refers to me as an assistant basketball coach. All right. Been a professor 20 years. I manage a large portfolio. I hold an endowed professorship. But still at that moment in time, when he saw me at the faculty senate meeting, he didn't think I was a professor. He didn't think I was an administrator. He didn't think I was an alum. He went straight to the assistant basketball coach card. And I'm sure many of you you know, have stories like that, you know, and I think we call them microaggressions and things of that nature. So sometimes when I'm giving a formal presentation at the University of Texas, I always introduce myself as an assistant basketball coach. And then I don't know if people know whether to laugh or they just sit there with, with, with a blank stare on their face. So anyway, all right, so let's move on. So um, I kind of got my start in college athletics. Now again, I've never worked a day in college athletics, I, I, but I got my start in this as a first year PhD student at Ohio State in 1994. My boy said, man, come over to the football office with me. They looking for tutors and they pay a lot of money and they were paying good money. So it just started off to me as sort of a money hustle. I grew up in Cleveland. You know, I thought, you know, a lot of these brothers had it made. The sisters who played basketball had it made. But when I started tutoring and mentoring um, and having these young people in my class as a graduate student, I decided I wanted to devote, to devote my life's work in many ways uh, to helping African-American student athletes. My first job out of uh, graduate school was at LSU, LSU, uh, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, 1998 to 2007. Uh, did some great work there for nine years, really got involved in the lives of student athletes. But more importantly, that is where I began to hold people accountable, uh, the people in athletics, head coaches, and also the university administration. Left there in 2007, and I've been at the University of Texas for the last 13 years. Uh, UT is an awesome place to be. You know, it has its problems, but we're working on them. And so I'm the kind of person that just likes being somewhere and doing impact. And I want to tell the young professionals on the, on the call, because they see some of us getting speaking engagements and things of that nature. It is a marathon and not a sprint. Some of us have been doing this work a long time, and I want to encourage you. Be patient with the process. When I hear a lot of young people talk, well, Doc, I'm trying to be on the fast track. I'm trying to be here for three years, then I'm moving here for three years. And I tell young people, you got to go somewhere and you got to make it home and you got to become fully invested in the community. Because here is what's happened. here's what happens. If you have a two-year plan at this school then a three-year plan, you will exploit people and you will exploit friendships to get to where you were trying to go. I value going through the process. And let me give you a quick McDonald's analogy if I, can, if I can give it. My first job was at Burger King. And at the Burger King I worked at, 
everybody started off um, the draft through window number one. You basically just collected money. If they trusted you, you collected money. I went from the drive through collecting money. I went to the drive through putting the food together and putting the food in people's cars. Then I moved to the front cash register. Then I moved to fries. I moved to unloading the truck and, and knowing how to stack the meat up in the freezer. And then I learned how to put meat on the grill and prepare burgers. Then I moved out to some extent um, to the dining area, cleaning up the dining area and cleaning up the restrooms. Let me tell you why I think this is important. And I've learned this from people who've become McDonald's franchise owners. When you apply to become a McDonald's franchise owner and you got your bread together, you got your money together, the people that are moved to the front of the line in terms of getting a franchise are people who have worked at McDonald's because they know all facets of the operation. And so young people, me starting off as an assistant professor, now holding an endowed professorship, and me starting off as a director of a black studies program, directing a program in the grad school at LSU, to assistant VP, associate VP, senior associate VP, and now vice president, it gives me the ability to do the high level stuff, like I'll go meet with people on the Board of Regents, but then I can go to an inner city high school in Dallas and kill it with 111th graders. So young people, don't be so caught up in getting there quick because it's not about how fast you get there, it is about can you stay. And many of us who have been in the game a long time, we've seen a lot of young people, energetic, a lot of zeal. We have seen them come and we have seen them crash and burn. So understand when somebody who's been in the game longer than you is trying to give you some advice, they're, trying, they're not trying to quench your spirit or muzzle you. And they're not telling you to, to sell out. They're just saying, hey, young brother, hey, young sister, this is a marathon and not a sprint and just pace yourself because we can't win all the battles, all right? Now, I wanna, I wanna talk a little bit about you. I want you to ask yourself, and I want this to be self-reflective, how are you professionally wired? Because before we talk about how to move the ball down the field, how to get stuff done, you have to understand your own professional DNA. Some of us are cut out to go and bring about big change. Some of us are cut out to do impactful work. Some of us, others are cut out just to be a maintenance person. I'm not a maintenance guy. My orientation is to take something and rebuild it or take something from scratch and build it. Couple examples. When I got to LSU, when they named me director of the African American Studies Program, there was no budget, there was no office, there was no secretary. And we were offering as a program five classes per, uh, per semester. Within two years, we went from offering five classes a semester to roughly 19. And once we got the number of classes up, that justified a larger budget, it justified physical office space, and it also gave a justification for full-time staff. Uh, so again, that is how I'm wired. I am wired to build, I am wired to construct, I am very entrepreneurial. So the question is, how are you wired? And if you aren't wired like that, that's fine. But you got to know how you were wired because some of us aren't trying to get stuff done. Some of us are just content to have a seat at the table. A couple examples. One reason why I wanted to show you the, the, the scope of my operation at Texas, because the term chief diversity officer, it doesn't really mean anything. I know some chief diversity officers at universities that have no budget. They don't have an admin person and they don't even have a separate office apart from their faculty office, all right? But that's why you can't be so thirsty to get a title because you want to be able to be at the table and be a player. A UC school contacted me about four years ago about a vice chancellor position for diversity. And it's vice chancellor position, their equivalent of a vice president. And I remember asking them, I said, okay, what is in the portfolio? Here was their response the Black Cultural Center, a Chicano Cultural Center, and a Women's Center. That was it. Four employees, that was the only thing in the portfolio. And so I remember asking the person sharing the search, how do I sit in a cabinet meeting with the chancellor of the university and the other vice chancellors if my portfolio is insignificant? I don't have any money. I can literally only buy pizzas for the kids. 
and the job was structured to have no impact. So people, please understand, don't chase titles. You wanna chase influence and impact. And so don't be so thirsty for a title. It sounds good, but then you'll meet people like me and say, okay, brother, sister, you got that big title, what are you doing with it? All right, I wanna, so I want you to be thinking about how you are professionally wired. Number two, in terms of getting things done, I want you to think about the culture in which you operate. And this is very important. You gotta understand where you are. And I'll give an LSU example, and I'll compare it to being at Texas. LSU, great people, no money, no turf battles. At LSU, you could do whatever you wanted to do. Nobody cared because they didn't have any money to, to give it to you. So I, I, after Katrina, me and my boy and about eight of our students, we decided to start a mentoring program for black boys and girls in Baton Rouge, what was then the worst middle school in America after Katrina, the worst middle school in America by far. So I went to LSU. They gave me no money for the program, of course, but here's what they gave me. They gave me a classroom. And understand, academic ca campuses are wide open on Saturday. Here's why I like the classroom. I had all the technology. There was AC in there. And so we were able to have an effective program. Now, they gave me no money, but they didn't care about us starting the program. Let's come to Texas now. Texas, a lot of money. You're going to have a big budget, just like I, just like I talked about. But at, at Texas, you got turf battles. So at Texas, you got to be much more collaborative with how things operate. Texas is an institution that is driven by personal relationships. Some places, it's all transactional. Texas, personal relationships. Take people to lunch. Take them to lunch off campus. Ask them about their kids. Ask them what church they go to. So that's how the two places are different. So understand, A, your individual department and the broader culture of the institution. Now let me hit you with this one. We don't think about this nearly enough. How is your supervisor or your boss wired? So many of you work in athletics, so let's talk about how is the AD wired? You know how you can find out how the AD is wired? Look at their training, and I'll give you an example. When I first started at the University of Texas, the president was Bill, Bill Powers. He was a law professor, did a lot of stuff around civil rights. So to President Powers, you could make the social justice argument to him, he would support it. The president who hired me as a vice president, follow me now, engineered by training. They don't want to read a whole bunch of stuff. They want to see numbers. They just want to see numbers, all right? When we, in many ways, revamped our whole sexual misconduct Title IX office on the faculty staff side, we were short-staffed. I just put together a document that said, our peer institutions have 12, 13 staff. We have five. Guess what happened? They gave us a ton of money to go hire eight or nine people. So that's an engineer. My president now is the former dean of the business school finance person. So the way I believe he processes information will be in terms of return on investment. This is important. You have to know how people above you are wired to receive information and what things are important to them because that'll tell you what they will support and what they won't support. Does that make sense? Somebody give me a high five or something because I feel like I'm just talking, it, talking into a screen. Thanks, Mike. All right. So, and we don't think about that enough. You may go from Miami to Mississippi State. The culture is different. For instance, at the University of Texas, if you've ever been to Austin, Texas, it's a city with a lot of wealthy people, but nobody displays their wealth. Nobody displays it. These folks will dr drive up in bicycles, a Mini Cooper, but they got big old cribs and they got tons of money, but that is just the culture of the place. You don't flaunt your wealth in Austin, Texas. So you got to understand the culture and understand this. When you are moving from different regions of the country to other regions, you have to understand that. You've got to understand that. As a former pastor, I tell people I'm still saved and filled with the Holy Ghost. I just don't pastor anymore. Um, when I'm in LSU, Talking to white conservatives, I can take them to church. I can't do that as much in Austin. I can do it in Houston and Dallas, but Austin, large population, large atheist population, couldn't do it at Ohio State. So now, let me tell you why this is important. You all are going to get job offers, but you got to think, okay, who am I reporting to? 
and what is the culture like? And let me drill down on this port because this, and we all want to be wanted. So in my profession, getting a call from Harvard about a job, that's like the holy grail for us, all right? So the Kennedy School at Harvard called me about a job. Now, they didn't offer it to me. I, I believe I could have got it if I wanted it, all right? But I didn't go through the process. When I began to think about the culture in Boston, particularly as it relates to diversity issues, white liberals are good people. But in some segments of the country, diversity is more aligned with, diversity does, does, does not really mean black and Latino issues. And so you gotta think about that stuff. What do you bring to the table? Am I gonna fit there? What is the culture like, all right? I was at the University of Oregon in an interview six years ago for, for a VP position. Eugene is a strange place. Now I got on the plane going up there to this interview like, I'm about to get this job. I'm going to get all this Nike money, and we're going to go build these community centers in the hood. Miami, New Orleans, Dallas, L.A., San Francisco. Yeah, I had it all laid out. I get to the interview at Oregon, and we were talking about what we had done, particularly with black males at the University of Texas, in many ways to, uh, what do they call it, when you got more feet, to, to, to decrease the gender gap, all right, on campus. And so we talked about are these strong black male initiatives we had to decrease that gender gap. Somebody on the search committee says, he said, well, Dr. Moore, a black male initiative is offensive to me. He said, because it has been my experience, this is a white guy talking, that these kind of initiatives do nothing but reinforce toxic masculinity. So when he said that, and none of the black folk around the table had my back, hell, I can go home. You, you may, I can go to the mall, walk around, and then go back to Austin, Texas. But you got to understand the culture of where you are going. All jobs aren't meant for you. Funny story. Harvard called about two years ago. MIT called me in January. And they called me four or five times. They got to the point, Doc, can you just get on the plane and come to Boston? Here's funny. Most people see MIT as a nerdy place. And Harvard is being more liberal. Harvard will be probably more supportive of um, diversity as, as it relates to race. Guess what I found? The MIT people were more invested in the race piece than Harvard was. All right? So you have to do some work, who you're going to report to, and what is the culture. And thirdly, does it fit? If, if you're an HBCU person or if you're a Black Greek person, if that's your life, and we got some of them on the call, right? If you want to get with the bras and you want to get with your sorors, you may not go to a place well, that's going on, and you will be miserable. I'm a black church guy. When I was flying over Eugene, Oregon, I knew that, I knew that they didn't have any black churches. I could look at the trees and tell. I'm like, I'm not going to survive up here, all right? So there are some things that are important to you, and just don't, don't take a job just to take it. Cool? We moving on? All right. Uh, let's move on. So let's talk about uh, alignment. We have gotten a lot done in our division because I know how to align our priorities with the priorities of the institution. We have five study abroad programs, Dubai, Beijing, Cape Town, Mexico City, Costa Rica. Now, the university had a strategic plan to get more kids abroad, but when I looked at the data, we realized there were no black and brown people going abroad. The entire international office was set up for sorority girls to walk in the office give them a $7,000 check and to go to Barcelona, all right? But I knew that, you know what? If I can take these kids from the hood who, got, who have to adapt, all, who, who are taught to be adaptive, and these, and these Latino kids from the border, all right? I said, if we can create some programs for them, it will level the playing field out. So for the last seven or eight years, we've been taking 80 to 90 black and brown kids abroad every summer. And this past spring, we were taking 30 kids to Dubai over spring break, and then another 60 to Cape Town this summer, and another 50 to Beijing this summer, all right? So, so here's my point. Nobody could talk, nobody could hate on it because it was in line with what the university was talking about. Number two, we launched a big time inclusive innovation and entrepreneurship office at the university. You know why? Because they had all these entrepreneurship programs, but if you pull back the curtain, there were no black or brown kids being a part of them. So I went and found a sharp Latino brother who's known in the venture capital world, 
entrepreneurial world, hired him at a, at a burger at a burger stand, and he's come in and he's killing the game. And so you got to learn how to connect what you want to do with the overall um, with the overall objectives of the department. Does that make sense? One quick example. Move on. Every every department you are working, they want to raise money. One thing I've noticed across the country is that often African American alums. Uh, are not engaged in many ways like white daughters. If you want to bring more black folk to the table, go create an African-American development initiative where you tell the AD or the senior associate for development, hey, I want to go connect with these folk who, who graduated from here because I think in many ways they can help our bottom line. You will get support. So you got to think about alignment. All right, let me move on. One more before we get to race. This is partnership. You got to learn how to operate across the department. In my world, I have to learn how to operate with the deans, the provost office, my colleagues on the VP council, people on the board of regents, because that's how it works. Now, with my budget, with a $40 million budget, I don't really have to ask anybody for permission. I can just go do it. Now, our study abroad programs, we could run them on our own. But I understand about partnership, the international office needs to be able to eat about eat, eat off that as well so that is why we partner when you partner with people when you ask people how can i make your job easier guess what you will have a ton of people invested in your success so again in my role with my budget i don't have to partner with anybody but it makes my job easier when i can go to the provost or to the dean of the business school or to the dean of engineering school or to my boy scott vp of development and say scott man how can I partner with you to get more African-American and Latino employees into the development space? All right, so partnership is critical. Now, let's get down to the nitty gritty. So leadership in and of itself, people, is difficult. It is difficult, all right? And, pr and pray for your college presidents and your ADs, because I would hate to be in their position as of June 3rd, all right? They got tough decisions to make, and we have an interim president who just started June 1. I told him, congratulations, brother because it's going to be tough. All right, here we go. The race stuff, and I'm sure, have, have any of y'all ever showed up somewhere and they thought you were somebody else? I went to a high-level dinner um, in Austin with a bunch of my colleagues. And when I showed up, they referred to me as somebody else. The other person they referred to is about 65, I'm six feet, he's six six. So when he showed up, they gave him, they gave him my name tag. And when I showed up, <laughs> this is funny, they gave me his name tag. All right, here we go. I was a keynote speaker at an event in South Texas. I get there early, I had to get to events early. I was speaking to a bunch of uh, high school seniors and their parents. I get there early, I'm standing at the back of the auditorium. The school superintendent comes up to me. And I said, hey, I'm Leonard Moore from the University of Texas. He says, hey, I'm so-and-so, school superintendent. Uh, thank you for coming down for the event. And here was the next question. Um, did Dr. Moore come with you? I said, Leonard Moore, he it went over his head. He said, did Dr. Moore come with you? I said, no, he didn't come with me. He's, he's coming. He should be here in about 15 minutes. But people, it happens all the time. Me and my wife and my family were at the Texas OU game. We go every year. And this is hilarious. We're sitting there, 50-yard line tickets, about 20 rows up. And um, a, a white guy in front of me turns around and says, um, is your son on the team? I said, no, nah, man, the only son I have is right here, and he's 12. All right? And I said, is your son on the team? And he said, no. He said, well, did you play at UT? And I said, no, nah, I didn't even go to school at UT. I said, did you play at Texas? And he said, no. And then he's looking puzzled. And my wife says, why do you keep asking my husband these questions? His response was, because I'm trying to figure out how you got these tickets. And that happens often. I was at LSU when I was a professor there. As professors, you can check out a book for an entire semester. Why you would need a book that long, I don't know, all right? So it was a Friday. I may have had on slacks and a shirt, jeans and a shirt. I go, 
the student swipes my card at the library. And I guess it popped up, book due back December 12th, 13th, whatever. It was early September. She says, oh, you a faculty member? I said, they told me I was, <laughs> right? She looks at the screen, looks at my ID again. She says, let me go get my manager, all right? She goes and gets the manager. The manager comes out. You a faculty member? At this point, I'm like, well, hell, maybe not if y'all keep asking me, all right? Then she says, oh, oh, yeah, I guess you are a faculty member. We just needed to double check, all right? Now, here's the point, black professionals. That stuff happens to us every day, every single day. You ever been in a meeting before? People make comments at the meeting. Whenever somebody says something, other people respond. But when you say something at the meeting, the room goes silent. Nobody co-signs, right? Or you're left out of the meeting. They had a meeting, excluded you, and other people are talking about your stuff in your portfolio. And you're like, well, when the hell did this happen? All right? So folks, it happens. It's exhausting. And I know you're frustrated. I know sometimes you want to quit, all right? But here's what somebody said. If you aren't at the table, you are probably on the menu, all right? You all have, I was on campus about a month ago. And, I, and, 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 and the biggest perk I have with my job, Mike, I'm looking at you, man. The biggest perk I have with my job, Mike, is I have, a, I have an all access parking pass. I can park anywhere on campus, just as long as not for you know, a disability slot. Check this out. So uh, because of my parking pass, I can go through the center of campus and the little gates will raise up on their own, all right? So I'm, so I'm coming up, the gate, rate, uh, the, the, the gate rises. As I am coming through the intersection, uh, a campus police officer gets coming the other way, gets out of their lane, and gets right in front of me and blocks me. And then when they see my sticker on my car, uh-oh, they didn't know what to do then because it's an old sticker, and they say, oh, it's for the VIP. They knew they had messed up. So, boy, I, now I don't cuss. I rolled down the window, and I say, man, what the hell are you doing? And he was so apologetic. But my point is, it happens all the time. And you can't let that distract you from what God has called you to do. You can't let it distract you, all right? You can't. But here's what, this, here's what microaggressions and microinvalidations lead to. And I want y'all to get in the chat, tell me if, if you've ever had this before. Any of y'all ever had imposter syndrome before? You go to an event and you just don't feel like you fit in, all right? There was an event, uh, at a school in the South. And this is a white dean telling me this. He said, Dr. Moore, uh, I need your university to help us. He said, I went to an event at the home of a wealthy donor. He said, when he walks in the house, when he gets to the porch of the house, there are about, on the porch and inside the house, there are about 20 black people all dressed in tuxedos. And they are serving drinks, serving food, greeting people at the door. The entire audience was white. Now, as a white man, he said he left because he was offended. But how many of us have been in situations like that where you're, you're there because of work or you've been invited and people ask you, um, are y'all going to bring out some more drinks? Are they going <laughs> to put out some more food? You're like, hell, how do I know? All right. But this stuff happens all the time and you can't get frustrated. So imposter syndrome, you get it. But let me tell you this, folks. You are built for this stuff. You are some of the events that I go to nationally, and I'm around a table with people with these fancy titles. Has that ever happened to you before? You're like, how did you get this job? That happened to you before? You're like, I can't, you know, so we used to think that people were smart. And again, some people are, but every now and then you come across a room full of folk where their whole life, this brother said on the chat, he got mistaken for being a valet. Maybe you should have took their car and just and, and went around the block or something like that. All right. All right. But he, he, here's how else it impacts us. And this is what happened to me at LSU. When you feel you are underpaid and you get overlooked, you work harder. And what we call this is John Henryism. 
You know, John Henry, that folk hero, they said he could, you know, he could stop a, a train with his bare hand, but he died from overwork. What I have found in the corporate space and in higher ed, ed and in college athletics, many of us are doing the jobs of three or four people, but only getting paid to do the job of one. But we are told, but what but we say, I'm working hard, they're gonna see, and we know what our grandparents and parents told us, you gotta work twice as hard to go half as far, all right? So that's John Henryism, and let me tell you this, get compensated for the work you do. Because one thing I've learned about American capitalists, if they don't put money behind it, then they probably don't value it, all right? So uh, I'm gonna stop there, and, um, and we'll see if we have some questions. But this has been very therapeutic for me. I'm in a hotel in Cleveland, Ohio, uh, my hometown. So if you see three teenagers walk behind me, they're my kids, all right? Or my wife may walk behind me. So that's, that's I thought I was gonna have to do this from a funeral home, but luckily um, the funeral's not till uh, later today. Came to Cleveland to get a book done. Uh, uncle, who he had been sick for a while, passed. Um, and so we just decided to make a family, family trip up. All right, uh, what questions we got? Dr. Moore, thank, thanks for your remarks. I mean, it, this was powerful. The chat was on fire just now uh, with, with remarks and, and different quotes from what you had to say. So it's clear that um, this has been impactful for our group. You know, we appreciate the strategies uh, that you have provided us and helping us through our daily interactions. Uh, my first question um, uh, touches on uh, allies. Uh, in order to move forward with this important work, we need allies in our department. What are some strategies and tips that we can use to build relationships uh, and create allies that offer us uh, space and conversations outside our sphere of influence. I mean, I think the quotable that you had was, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. Yeah. How can we um, make sure that our, that our, that our, uh, our feelings are, are being communicated in this, in this, in this sphere? Thank you, Mike. The, the issue of uh, allies is a tricky one. I have been a lone ranger a lot of times. My f philosophy is, I'm going to get it done and kill it. Then you're going to want to be on board. And I'll give you an example. When we started our Black Student Athlete Summit five years ago, we probably had 70 people. This past January, Mike, we had about 530. And what, so that has been, that has been, Mike, the way that I operate. I'm gonna just go do, all right? And I'm gonna try to kill the game completely. And because we're gonna do it so well, you are gonna wanna ask to be a part. Does that make sense? Because sure. for me, Mike, I have to control the content and I have to control the initiative. If I try to get, if I try to go the ally route early on, then I'll be launching your initiative and not mine. So that's my response to that. All right. No, I think that, that that falls in line with the old adage. I'll show you better than I can tell you. For Absolutely. Sure. Uh, the next question I have uh, touches on a theme that I heard from you uh, earlier on in your remarks and from a speaker that we had yesterday. Uh, and that was the moment that, that you became comfortable speaking up. W was there a particular experience you had or was there a similar moment that kind of shifted your thinking? To, to, to I, can give you, I can give you the specific day. When I got to LSU in August of 1998 as a professor, I had just turned 27, all right? Did a lot with ball players at Ohio State, men's women's basketball players, football, track team. So I, I knew when I went to LSU, I wanted to engage that population, right? The Bible talks about the least of these. And I think on a college campus, black, brown kids, uh, probably transgender kids and student athletes out in low-income kids, I would put in that category, the least of these. So hear me out. A day before school started, check this out, man. The day before school started, my office at LSU overlooked the quad, all right? Best view of campus. The football players would, would create this kind of like this, this, uh, uh, this gauntlet where all the women would have to walk through them, get in the other part of campus, all right? And so it seemed harmless at first, you know, so I'm observing. And I'm in my office the day before school, and I hear a big commotion, Mike. I run out there, I'm like, what happened? And they said, Joe Bean just threw something in this girl's face. L listen to this now. And I don't know if that, that, that name was right, but listen to this. This brother, may have been Mike, but anyway, this brother went home over the summer, had a concoction of urine and egg yolk, and he sat it outside his front porch for the entire summer. When that sister walked through campus on the first, the, the day before school started, he threw it in her face. And if that wasn't tragic enough, the brothers did nothing. They laughed. And so that day, Mike, I went to the football office and I said, hey, I'm Dr. Moore. I'm a new professor. I need you to put all the brothers in my class. And guess what? 
from that point on, Mike, it was on and popping. I wrote a letter to the president. I said, things here are out of control. The brothers aren't graduating. It's an outlaw culture. And uh, that's when I started speaking my voice. But, he, but let me say this, Mike. That ain't, that's not everybody's role. That is not everybody's role, all right? I believe that it's my role. I believe I'm cut from that cloth, but it is not everybody's role. All right, that's helpful. That's helpful. Uh, we're going to now turn it over to some questions from uh, the chat. Um, so uh, again, as a reminder, if you have questions for Dr. Moore, uh, please uh, feel free to drop them in the chat. Uh, and we'll make sure that those questions are asked. Hey, Michael, we do have one question from Mr. He said, I don't get mistaken for valets, but I do get intense questioning on what I do and how I get my title. I ask the same and they stop short of sharing any information about themselves. I surprised at this since they probably don't understand your grind item. How do you navigate those conversations? So me, uh, you all heard of uh, Ricky Williams, uh, former running back for, for Texas, right? Uh, but anyway, so he came back to school I don't think he finished his degree. You know, Ricky, he goes underground every two or three years. He'll emerge, Doc, I want to finish my degree. So we were at an event at the Four Seasons, a recruiting event at the Four Seasons. And this is going to crack you up, uh, Tony. We come out, we're waiting to bring, they're waiting to bring the cars around. And, a, and, and, and some alum comes up to him, say, hey, Ricky Williams, how you doing, so-and-so? And Ricky says, hey, I want you to meet my favorite professor, Dr. Moore. He teaches an amazing class called the Black Power Movement. The person didn't even respond. <laughs> they just looked at me and looked at Ricky and just like asked for his autograph. But it happens often. So Derek, man, I feel you. When I tell people what classes I teach, I say I teach a class called the Black Power Movement and a class called Race in the Age of Trump. There is no follow-up conversation after that. All right, it is like conversation over. And if I mention that I'm VP for diversity and community engagement, also typically the conversation stops right there. So Derek, man, been in those shoes many times. Can I throw something out real quick? Absolutely. Yeah. You have the floor. Absolutely. This deals with people in leadership and staffing. Let me say this. If you are going to assume a leadership position, one of the fundamental questions you have to ask, do I have the ability to build my own team? Let me say it again. Do I have the ability to build my own team? You have got to be borderline ruthless. You got to get a team behind you that supports your vision, people who are gonna be loyal to you and loyal to the organization. What I've seen happen with black administrators, we are very nice to people. And some of the people we are nice to are some of the main ones who come and cut us down from behind. You have got to build you a team of people. I understand why these coaches do it. I understand why athletic directors do it because the stakes are so high, you don't have time to be wondering as you're trying to implement your agenda, is this person on the team? What is this person's allegiance lie? I'm not talking about having a bunch of yes men and yes women. I'm talking about people who are on the team and you cannot be afraid to fire people. When I became interim VP, the first thing I asked the president, I knew we'd have to do a national search. The first thing I asked the president, what are my limitations as interim VP? He said, Leonard, run the office. I said, is there anybody that needs to be protected? He said, Leonard, run the office. And so my point is, you, you all come across sharp colleagues in your profession. Start taking down names. Say, hey, when I get in the leadership position, this is the team I'm going to build. All right? And I knew the kind of team that I needed to build. Because here's the issue. My unit at Texas was established 2005, launched in 2007. And this is important. So in many ways, it was constructed to meet the needs in 2010. This, this, this is important. I had to restructure the office to meet the needs as it relates to diversity and inclusion for 2025 and 2030, all right? And that is very, very important. Now, here's the thing. 
Uh, some, some of my colleagues tell me, they said, sometimes, Dr. Moore, when you try to be benevolent with people, well, you know, well, I'm going to give them a year and stuff like that, sometimes it comes back to bite you, all right? So what we have done, you know, I, I'm compassionate and I'm empathetic, but I got to get people on the team because at the end of the day, I'm going to be held accountable. Okay, we have another question from Wilson. Now that we have the era of so many, and now that we have the era of so many, how do we use the opportunity to get more of us in positions of power? ADs, head coaches, presidents, et cetera. Well, well let me say this. Um, I've been, I, I spoke at, uh, when the Final Four was in San Antonio two years ago, and I want y'all to hear this. There's a young man who has an organization. We had 40 to 50 of the top D1 men's assistant basketball coaches. So he created this kind of boot camp to prepare these coaches to go to the next level. 70% of the room is black males. Okay, they're, they're, they're the top D1 assistant coaches in the country. And I told them to a person that I had been disappointed in them because we had fought for you all to get jobs and get opportunity. But from where I sit, it seems as the student athlete experience hasn't changed. And here's what I asked him. Can you encourage the brothers to get internships? Can you go to bat for them when they want to study abroad? Can you talk to the head coach and say, Coach, I appreciate you bringing, you having motivational Mondays and bringing people in. But, Coach, if you don't create any time in the summer for these young men to get away and get some real world work experience, it's just lip service. So I understand positions of power, but, but you know, some people have disappointed us. You know what I mean? Some people have disappointed us. Um, and so that, that is a tough, that is a t that's, that's a tough question, but everybody's not cut out to bring meaningful change and impact. Let me say that. This question comes from Jamil Northcutt. Numbers are still low as it relates to sports regarding college attendance of black men. What are some things being done to tackle this issue? Also, it seems sometimes that black folks in positions don't hire other black people. Can you provide your insight on that phenomenon? Let me, let me deal with the professional piece first, Doc. <laughs> and then we'll come back to the, to the, to the, to the uh, African-American male undergraduate piece. Um, I'll put it like this. Here's what I tell college coaches and administrators. And, and I got this from a former track coach at UT, a sister. Here's what she said. She said, Dr. Moore, when I got hired as the first black coach of any sport in Texas, I was told, now I don't go hiring a bunch of black folk now, all right? She said, no, that's exactly what I'm gonna do. Because if, I, if I'm winning Big 12 championships and national championships, it don't matter. And if I'm losing, it don't matter. And her, her point was, if I'm winning, nobody cares. And if I'm losing, I'm getting fired anyway. So I tell people, we gotta quit, we, we have to stop thinking like that. You go get people who can add to the team and add tremendous value, all right? Now, to Jamil's first point, we have to recruit black male high school students the way we recruit athletes. The one thing I've been, I, when I go to, I go to about 35 high schools a year in Texas, not because I want to, but because I like to. It keeps me grounded. You know what a lot of our black and brown kids are told? Don't borrow money for college. Don't borrow, they, they are steered to two-year colleges. Two-year colleges have their place, but they don't have the support structure of a four-year institution. But that message is never preached in middle-income communities. Now, I'm talking about be responsible with student loans, but it's like these people are taught that if you can't write a check for it, then don't go. And that has been circulating around our communities for two or three decades, and we always point to a cousin or a sister or a niece well, you know, your cousin went down there and she brought all that money, didn't graduate, and it has a trickle-down effect. But we got to start recruiting them. We got to be more active in the recruiting spaces and going to the high schools and engaging with them. Thank you for that. Next question from Dr. Eric Hart. To follow up to that conversation, what types of questions do you ask of individuals to find out information that helps you make those types of decisions? implications still in a team and weeding out noise that sound good. So so when I built my team, when I built my team in Texas, my thing is I don't care where you went to school, that that means nothing to me. Uh, 
do you have a body of work? And actually, I am probably more impressed if you were, if you were at a small school and did some dynamic stuff. And let me say this. Everybody want to be at a power five school. I understand that. But do you realize if you go to a smaller school, you may be able to build a more substantive body of work? Because if I go to a place like a, 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 a Saul Ross University, all right, or a small HBCU where the budgets are tight, I can learn a lot about a different stuff. And guess what? I can, when I'm on an interview process, I can say, when I took over this program, we were here and now we are here. But too often we get caught up in, in the school. And I'll tell you this, don't become loyal to a logo. I have seen a lot of that take place. Don't become loyal to a logo. All right. Mm -hmm. Did I answer his question? Does that help? Sure. Maybe. <laughs> you've been running the gamut today, Dr. Moore. You, you, you've been, uh, you've been uh, answering a lot, of, a lot of questions and saying a lot of things that we need to hear. So we yeah. greatly appreciate that. You got time for more? All right. This question is from Alexander Shepard. As a new GA on campus this upcoming August, how do I know what is doing too much or too little in regards to my desired efforts to raise up black men? As the former student president of my campus's black men's group, I personally and through others know how much that group impacted me as a student, and I want to do my best to help other black male students have the same kind of personal development experience. This is a, a GA? This is a GA? Yes, upcoming okay. GA. Now, I'll say this. Uh, the sisters need your help, too. Let me say that, all right? Uh, and, and then let me go further. You got to you, you got to tailor your job description. That's number one. That's number one. Everything I do in terms of college athletics, none of that is in my job description. But if our Title IX office is falling apart, if our student services disabilities, if our kids can't get their exams on time, you know what I'm saying? If if the things that I am paid to handle, if our charter school is falling apart, if the things that I am paid to handle are not being taken care of, I have no business doing nothing else. So you got to make sure that, you know, because that's your passion, black males, you have to make sure the job description is handled. Number one, that you are overproducing, then that'll free up space to do other things on campus. All right. And I'll tell this, I'll say this young people, sometimes you have to work your way up to folks to get to the point where you can focus on things you are passionate about. All right. But sometimes you want to come out the gate but sometimes, no, you know, you're going to work in fan engagement and you're going to be at that basketball game, that men's women's basketball game, sitting at that scores table, making copies. And it is what it is. Mm -hmm. Tony, I think I we have, have time for about one or two more questions. Perfect. Next question. What is your relationship like with UCAD Del Conte? Oh, that's my guy. Now, let me tell you something. <laughs> let me tell you something. This is funny. Um, I, I told my, my nephew, I said, yeah, man, you know, me and Del Conte got an interesting relationship. You know, we we like each other, but then we have conflict. He said, y'all the same, because y'all y'all both got big egos, all right? <laughs> so, so so game recognized game. But, um, you know, I, I appreciate him. You know, I, I appreciate his heart. You know what I mean? Um, and, le and let me say this. Some of you all may be disappointed um, that your AD or coach may have issued a weak statement. Please don't use a statement as, as a racial litmus test in terms of somebody being, being, being committed to equity. Because I know some coaches who haven't said anything, but behind the scenes, they are killing it. And I, most of the coaches that I see, a lot of them, they're doing this because they don't want to be at a recruiting disadvantage, all right? <laughs> so please don't, don't be mad at your AD for not releasing a statement. Are you being treated well? Do black folk have opportunities? Are people moving through the pipeline? Well, don't let this one thing. People mad at Dabo, Dabo Sweeney. Well, man, if I was a, a Clemson ball player, I wouldn't go there. Those brothers trying to get to the league, plain and simple, all right? And, and they know Sweeney will help them get there. Now, I don't know about this linebacker coach calling somebody the N-word in practice. That, to me, that's over the line there. And I think, hopefully, uh, that'll be addressed before end of business today. Right? I think we have time for one more. Yep. That's all the questions I had on my end, unless anyone wants to drop in one final question. Renee, did you have anything that was sent to you privately? No, no more. But Leonard, would you um, 
just kind of wrap up with some of your um, dime knowledge that we've been talking about and, 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 and dropping up is specifically when it comes to um, minority women mm -hmm. um, moving into these athletic director roles and the things that we need to do. I'll say this, uh, sisters, you all are, you all are powerful. Y'all have a powerful network. You all don't seem as cutthroat as the brothers. Uh, so, you know, maintain, maintain that sisterhood. And the biggest thing I want to tell the people on the phone call, pick up the phone and call people for advice. You know what I do sometimes if I need, if I need to some advice from somebody somewhat important in the subject line, I will say, I am not looking for a job. They're going to click on it. <laughs> and what I say is, I just need 10 minutes of advice. I got an issue with Texas I'm trying to think through. And I know you have been here before. Young people, pick up the phone, get advice from folks. I tell people this all the time. I believe in reverse mentoring as well. Some of my best mentors are 19, 20, and 21 years of age. You know why? Because when we're getting ready to launch an initiative, I will run it by them first. And be like, hey, man, hey, how this look? This makes sense to you all? And they'd be like, no, that, that ain't going to work. So guess what we do? We scrap it, go back to the drawing board. So use the connections that you have. Thank you all so much. This has been a lot of fun. And I want to thank the MOA team. Y'all doing some great work. Uh, and I want everybody to take care of themselves. Again, you, I don't know when y'all staff meetings are, but you will be the spokesperson. But I gave you a strategy. Flip it back and just say, how is this making you feel? All right? Dr. Moore, thank you. This was an amazing and uh, powerful discussion. We appreciate you uh, joining with us, albeit virtually. Uh, you know, obviously, we hope that we get a chance to meet with you in person when we're back to in-person meetings and, and continue to build on uh, today's conversation. You, you all are welcome to attend our Black Student Athlete Summit in January. It's a can't-miss event. It's a lot of fun. It's a family atmosphere. And um, it, is, it is good to see more Black folk move into leadership roles. So thank you. Thanks. Yeah, I also wanted to thank Tony for facilitating the Q&A portion and Dr. Miles for uh, connecting uh, Dr. Moore with this group. Um, also earlier this week, Moe's leadership put out a statement that included several strategies to assist you all in moving forward conversations around diversity, inclusion, inclusion and equality. Uh, and we hope that today's session provided you with the tools needed to have some of these difficult conversations. Obviously, the demonstrations of the last week have created an opportunity for some dialogue within our departments. Uh, and like Dr. Moore just did, I challenge you all to put these strategies to use in the weeks and months to come. Uh, currently, we are uh, on schedule, uh, and I will uh, turn it over to Lauren Hamey for our next schedule.